And good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Buchanan. That's what I. That's what I go by. I'm. I'm not using a uh, a synonym or a pseudonym or whatever they call it. And uh, so my name is Tom. Call me Tom. Anybody calls me Thomas, it means my mother's calling me. And uh, so we don't want to do any of that stuff. And uh, yeah, I've been a ham for a little while, uh, 57 years, I guess. And uh, I've had a lot of fun in amateur radio. It's been a great time. So listen, I'm going to move over to my, uh, if I may, I can share my screen for you guys. Um, Warren, you've already filled in one of my slides. And uh, now I, I'm just going to preface this with a couple of things before we, uh, uh, before we actually get into the slides. Uh, the, the preface is that um, this is really, we're going to be talking about radio frequency interference tonight. Can everybody see my slide? Is there yes. anybody who? I can't see you guys all of a sudden my screen. Display. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So let me just take a look at this. So I'm just going to get you guys on so I can actually see you and uh, we'll see what's going on. All right, I'm not going to worry about it at this point. So what I have called this is radio frequency interference, finding it and determining what it is. We are all suffering from, from, from radio frequency interference, that's for sure. So I'm going to give you a bit of a definition the way I look at it. What are we here for? A discussion on RFI. RFI has become crucial to good operation on the amateur bands, and we all know that. It's not just... Um, with, uh, with anything like VHF or HF, it is everywhere, this RFI that we're having to deal with. And it's come with this digital world that we're involved with right now. We're here to identify common interference sources. We're gonna look at and listen to some RFI and we're, we'll identify ways to reduce RFI in your home and, um, and other places, of course. And we will talk about equipment to use to find RFI sources and we'll identify the sources to use to solve our RFI, uh, our resources, I should say, to solve the RFI uh, problems. And then we'll get into questions and answers after that. I think that's the format that you guys usually use. So who am I? I live in Coldale, I was licensed in 65. I'm an advanced with CW and basic. I worked in the electronics manufacturing business and instrumentation uh, till my retirement in 2002 and I'm a professional photographer and writer. I write a weekly newsletter for ham radio and teach basic and advanced online uh, for people here in Southern Alberta. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I'm teaching a class of 23 right at the moment, and they're from all across the country. Um, they advertised my, the course that I was put on, that I was putting on, and it's a free course for anybody that wanted to join. Um, and they advertised it on, on ham radio, uh, pardon me, hamshack.ca. And, uh, and it just, it blossomed from there. Started out with about 25 and I lost a couple because all of a sudden they realized that, holy cow, we're going to have to work. You know, it's not going to be given to them. And, uh, you know, that's what happens, unfortunately. I work all bands from my QTH in Coldale. I run uh, the Alberta Breakfast Club net on 3690 kilohertz at nine o'clock every Saturday morning. I'm a home brewer and I love designing and building stuff. And that's what I've done all my life. I'm, uh, I uh, uh, made my name by building a five band, single side band transceiver back in the seventies. Um, tubes, all tubes only, uh, there are a couple of transistors in it, but it was mostly tubes. Um, I've been plagued by RFI at my QTH and have successfully solved many of those problems. Um, and we'll talk about some of those tonight. So my station, I have lots of toys to play with. I live in Coldale uh, on a 150 by 50 foot lot. I have a modern station with four HF and six VHF and UHF radios. Uh, I have antennas covering 160 meters to 23 centimeters. And I use three SDR play SDRs as well for general coverage from VLF up to UHF. And, uh, and that's a picture of my shack the way it is right now. Um, you, you'll see something interesting here was I use a patch panel for all of my, uh, uh, for interconnecting all of my antennas and, and radios. It means I can put any radio on any antenna 
and uh, the linear is on there, and so is uh, the antenna tuner. This is a homebrew um, uh, differential antenna tuner that I built that can handle up to a kilowatt. And then there's all the other normal stuff that you would expect to see there in a shack. This is my brand new, my toy. It's a 7610 that I just bought a week or so back and uh, got rid of a 7300. Moving on, interference, what is it? RF interference signals are ones that obscure or eliminate the ones you wanna hear. It's that simple. It's noise that drives you crazy in some cases. Didn't have far to go in my case. It was a pretty short drive. They can be found on all frequencies from DC to nano waves. Typically, they come from man-made man -made devices that are not spectrally clean. Uh, such things as wall warts and uh, power supplies and, and um, toasters and, and um, refrigerators and your furnace and all sorts of other things like that can be, can be the source of... Uh, of uh, man-made interference that gets onto the HF bands and onto the VHF bands. I mean, anything from an automobile engine to a toaster or a fridge, and it's not atmospheric noise. Now, understand that this, uh, I didn't know what the, uh, um, uh, what the level of amateur radio operator that was gonna be on this particular thing tonight. So this is uh, sort of a little generic, we'll put it that way. Uh, it can be detected, identified, and reduced, or, and of course, it can be eliminated too, if you want to, or at least uh, reduced. That can usually be done with simple equipment that every ham owns already. Now, you don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff if you don't want to, but because you're a ham, you'll find some way to either big bore steel or whatever it is that you have to do and get it anyway. What is RFI? what RFI looks and sounds like. This is RFI. We're gonna play this. Uh, tell me if you can hear it or if you can't. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's what it looks like. Isn't that ugly? Oh my goodness. We'll be over in a second here. You see that spreads right across the spectrum there. This is caused by a malfunctioning light ballast. And we believe it was a grow up. And I think it was between two and three kilometers away. So that's how loud that thing was on, uh, in this particular case in the 80 meter band. Um, during the coldest part of the year last year, this was constantly on. It was always on 80 meters, and uh, and I even uh, I, I could even hear it up on 40 and 20 as well, and uh, it just spread out all over the place, and it was also lower in frequency too, so it was down in 2,500 uh, kilohertz, and uh, and was obscuring part of the broadcast band. Uh, as soon as it started to warm up, the problem went away. I don't know why. I think it might have to do with the fact that. Uh, Coldale is now the center for the RCMP for this area. So maybe it's got something to do with that. Using direction finding, I was able to isolate it to being east of my location, but then it stopped before I could get Industry Canada in to, get, to, to have a look at it. Uh, Industry Canada is interesting. When you deal with them, you send in the report, you give them all the information you can, and then they phone you and ask you for all that information again. And then you uh, give them the information and then they phone you and they say, well, um, is it still there? In other words, they're waiting for it to go away so that they can make the trip down there. And that's precisely what they did. But uh, I mean, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm just saying that that's, uh, that's the modus operandi that these people um, uh, seem to work with, unfortunately. And it is a long trip, you know, to go all the way from Calgary, all the way down to the Lethbridge area to go and uh, look for something that some dumb ham is uh, complaining about. What is RFI and what RFI looks and sounds like a game? This is an example of loose hardware on a power pole.
So that is sparking across some loose terminals as the wind blows. Now, as you know, it's rare that the wind ever blows down in this area. So we, uh, so we typically would never have anything like that happen here. But in this particular case, the wind got up to its, you know, its normal, uh, the normal uh, uh, velocity that it goes at here in Southern Alberta, which is um, well, someplace around 70 to 90 kilometers an hour. The pole was over 150 meters away from my, from my QTH. That's where the noise was coming from. And the utility utility or the electrical utility came out and looked at it and tightened the hardware and it was solved. It was that simple. They just simply came down. I had identified what pole it was for them and, uh, and they went right to it and saw exactly what the problem was and solved it. So you see, that's, that's the kind of stuff that you, uh, uh, that's the kind of response that you like to get. One of the things that I've done is I have created a, um, a pretty good rapport with the utility companies around this area so that they sort of know what it is that I'm giving them is going to be real. And uh, it's not going to be some trumped up stuff that, that, uh, uh, that nobody would ever believe. And uh, so I have a good relationship with them and that works out well. So I take care of a lot of RFI down in this area. And uh, as soon as I call, they get in touch with me and we work it out. And uh, I send them stuff back and forth by texting and by uh, email. Now, this one was easy to find. It was a new device that was in our house. You're gonna love this, watch this thing. That's my wife getting some exercise. Uh, this is a brand new treadmill that was in the house. If you listen to this, you'll recognize the interference from a motor controller, which is a pulse generator and is unfiltered. How these things get sold with this kind of inherent noise, I have no idea as to why they do that. It's just, uh, it's just a money grab. That'll teach me to buy cheap stuff. The thing only cost me a thousand bucks. So, you know, I'm just gonna have to spend a whole heck of a lot more money on one of those Pelotron things or something. Not. <laughs> what RFI looks like and sounds like, this is from my next door neighbor's treadmill. This is a little different, this one. walks more slowly. I'm not too worried about it because, uh, and this by the way was this morning, uh, I'm, because he or she will likely only be using it for a short time. And in fact, 10 minutes later on 40 meters, you can see what it looks like. It's absolutely flat across 40 meters. And uh, so I was very pleased with that. Uh, the noise level on the one at the top here was uh, what's it sitting at? Uh, minus 91.9 dBm. And uh, this is what it's at now, 94.7. So that's not too bad. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. What RFI looks like and sounds like, this is a power line noise from a faulty transformer. And this thing drove me crazy because this was right on two meters. Now, I'm going to show you the original one because I noticed it on VHF first, and then I found the major signal was coming at 152 kilohertz. And uh, this is what it sounded like. So it has a characteristic sound of 120 hertz, which is caused by the noise peaks at twice the line frequency. So if you look at it, here's the noise peak on one side, and there's the noise peak on the other side. And then there's a, a, a some sort of a, I don't know whether it's a harmonic or what it is, but there's something that follows it. And this is a typical pattern that you will find on AC line noise hash. And that's what it, and that's exactly what it looks like. This is often caused by, by delamination of the iron core in a power line transformer, I'm told. So they're going to replace the transformer shortly, they say. We'll see whether that happens or not, but I believe that they will because I believe what it is that this guy says. You can see how pervasive this inference, interference is from that transformer. Look at this one. This is on 146.54 megahertz. That's the same transformer. And this is the noise that's on my IC9700 on VHF. 
It's exactly the same problem as the previous example, only higher in frequency. And it also went way up into UHF as well. So I could hear it all the way up. And uh, you can tell that is a serious problem because that was affecting everything. 15 meters at my QTH is pretty much dead. I can't do anything with it. This is what 15 meters sounds like at my place. And as you can see, it's exactly 21 kilohertz from peak to peak, from there to there. And that tells me that it is an, uh, some either a, a switch or a router. It's a, a, uh, a slow switch or router. That's usually uh, 100, um, 100 uh, what do they call it? Megabits, I guess it is. Anyway, um, that's the problem, is the fact that this just makes interference right across the 15 meter band. So it's virtually impossible for me to use that band down here. I have not found the source yet. But I do mention here, if you hear of someone's house going up in flames down here, you'll know that I've, I've probably found the culprit and solved the problem. Atm atmospheric noise is not RFI in the sense that we are talking about it. Atm atmospheric noise is not man-made. It's largely caused by a nearest star doing its thing. And boy, has it been busy lately. I'll sometimes, uh, it will sometimes cause the bands to be as dead as a stone or will be a non-existent and everything opens right up. It's what HF propagation is all about. So I want you to take a look at this. Um, there's no, uh, um, oh, maybe there is. You can hear how quiet it is. That's right across the band. What am I on? And it's on 20 meters. And uh, you can see that, that without the antenna connected, that my noise level, my, my base level noise level is at minus 130 dBm. That's pretty good, you know? Now, watch this. This is the noise level with a vertical antenna connected. It's 100 dBm, and that's not too bad. That's this between there and there is atmospheric noise. And that's all it is. So pretty cool when you think about it. That's uh, that's not bad conditions when you think or when you look at it, is it? So what tools do I use? Good receivers are crucial. I use the SDR Play RP, RSP1, RSP DX, the RSP Dual Receiver. I recommend them because they use several different programs with them. They're inexpensive and They're easy. inexpensive. Sorry. Somebody said something? Nope. They're inexpensive and easy to integrate with your other gear. And they're locally available at GPS Central, nearly always in stock there. Their sensitivity is excellent and they're very quiet receivers as you can see from that past uh, uh, slide that I put up. Make sure you protect their front ends though. Don't go transmitting into them because uh, I'll tell you that, that that is an expensive exercise when you do that. HDSR, this is the software that I use. It's a great program to use for general coverage and ham radio bands up to 23 centimeters. Although it's useful for most ham bands, it's also an excellent choice for listening to everything in between and down into VLF. And I do listen to VLF from time to time. It has an excellent display with a good waterfall and a band scope. And it also integrates seamlessly with HRD and most modern radios. For those of you that don't know what that acronym is, that's Ham Radio Deluxe. The other one that I use is uh, SD Runo, is excellent as a, as a general coverage receiver interface. And it's provided by SDR Play free of charge and is upgraded from time to time. This is an excellent program. It covers from 10 kilohertz to 1,099.99 megahertz. And uh, if you use RSP Duo or R RSD, pardon me, SDR Runo has a diversity receiver that is the real thing and it works perfectly. Now, you do know that you remember perhaps from my bio that I was in the RCN for quite a while. And... Uh, and we used to use diversity receivers in order to, uh, to uh, receive all of the 
uh, cryptographic stuff that we had to get. It, uh, it has excellent displays with everything you'll ever need in terms of features. So how about portable radios? Any good portable radio will cover broadcast band up to 30 megahertz or above, and that will be useful. Make sure it has a loop stick antenna, antenna on it and an external antenna connection. It should also have a headphone jack. I use the Texan PL600 and it does a great job at finding interference. It's a really, really useful little device. It's a, a little hokey because it's inexpensive. They're not inexpensive now though. The latest model is the PL660, but any good AM portable radio will be a great place to start if you wanna try and find some interference. Here's an interesting solution. I have always wanted a portable waterfall and spectrum display radio that I could use to find RFI that is small and feature full. Some Russian guys designed a little box called a Malahite radio. And I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Out of the box, it's pretty much a piece of junk. But if you buy and download the upgrade firmware from Yorgi, um, and install it, it becomes a very useful radio. You can buy the clones out of China for about 150 bucks, and then contact Yorgi in Russia and buy the upgrade for $75. Uh, I've done several of these now with him and we've actually become friends. Or you can buy the full meal deal for about $250 Canadian. This is a neat little receiver. It's a metal box, everything is in there, it has a full, uh, it has everything that you would ever want to have on a communications receiver. Does it have some noise problems? Yes, it does. It has some internal noise problems. Specifically, the touchscreen display is a little bit noisy. And sometimes it's a little hard to get it to work the way you want it to. And these knobs are just bloody small. And so because of that, it's difficult to be able to tune and, uh, and turn the audio up and down. If anybody's got ham fists, yeah, like I have, it makes it very difficult to use it. But once you get uh, the feel for it and you start using uh, one of those uh, uh, devices that you use to, to poke touch screens with, uh, it works just fine. And uh, so what I did was I integrated it and that's probably what Tino was telling you about. So I built a little metal box to contain the radio and to serve as a portable system for taking outside to sniff out noise. And this is what it looks like. So here's the little radio. It's in this little metallic box or that, that I created. Uh, I do a bunch of metal work in my shop because I do a lot of homebrew building stuff. And uh, then I built a little um, uh, a band pass or pardon me, a, a band switch and also a uh, um, I tune it with a variac, but it's pretty cool to tune a series of loops that, that are tied all around on the inside of that thing. You can see in the cable or in the uh, loop that there's uh, some uh, wire inside there that goes around. And I think there's six turns all together. And, uh, and I just switch them out, all of those different and add or subtract them. So it works as a 12 inch loop. Uh, and would be expected to work, but it's very directional. So it's great for isolating noise, uh, noise sources, especially on the lower frequencies. The antenna covers from the broadcast band to the 25th um, uh, to 25 megahertz by switching the number of loops that are in series. I used it to determine the source of the AC hash I had at my place and it helped me identify the power pole it was coming from. And remember I said it was 150 meters away. That's what I used to find out where it was. So I'll just have one of my students send me a note. Anyway, not you guys. Let's move on to the next one. I put an old photographic handle on the bottom of it so that it's easy to hold at arm's length to use. And the case is made out of aluminum and bent up with a, cha uh, with a chassis on top and an opening below. All the information or all the, uh, uh, the tuning information or tuning uh, connections and the switch and everything are all in here with the Vera cap. I originally used a 365 picofarad capacitor, which was just a complete pain in the neck to, to deal with. So, uh, so I got rid of that and I put a Vera cap in there, which is a, a 600 picofarad Vera cap. 
and it works very well. And this is what it sounds like. So that tells you that, that uh, obviously we will receive on broadcast band and, uh, and it, it works very well. The loop is a piece of three H uh, plastic tubing with some multicolored flat wire and you've got to use, you've got to use multicolored wire. Otherwise you just get confused and never get it figured out. And, uh, and a piece of our RG174 uh, coax being used as a coupling antenna, which is in that tube as well. I haven't put the sense antenna into operation on this thing yet, as uh, the sense will allow me to be able to, um, to get a signal from only one direction. Um, and in, in this, you were listening to the broadcast band. It works all modes, and you can select the ham bands directly right on the front panel by simply going to the band here. A pretty neat, and it's, it's also got a fantastic noise reduction circuit in it but it doesn't get rid of the noise that we're looking for. <laughs> so, <laughs> Other tools that I use, the rotatable HF antenna is important. And I chose the MFJ1886, which is 36 inches across and has an LNA at the antenna itself. And of course it's powered via the coax. And I have this sitting on top of a, uh, of a, um, uh, a rotator and it works very well. It covers the entire HF band from broadcast to 30 megahertz. And not only is it a great antenna for sensing noise direction, but it's also a great one for nulling out offending noise, especially on the HF bands. There are lots of designs for RX loops out there as well. And I just finished doing an article on one that, uh, uh, that I sent out uh, and I sent the loop out to an old friend of mine out on the coast. He's not a ham, but he, wanted to listen to some stuff and he was being plagued with noise and all sorts of noise. And he, uh, uh, so he's put this antenna up now and he can null that noise right out using this antenna, which is pretty cool. He's, he figures it drops about 30 dB. So that's, a, that's pretty good when you start to think about it. Lots of designs for RX loops out there. And so try your hands and build some uh, homebrew ones if you like. This, was, uh, this goes from 50 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, this RX loop. And all that is, is, is a piece of LMR 400 that I have going around in that circle. And then it goes to an LNA that's in there in the box. And of course, then it's connected via, uh, via a, a, a T bias. Being able to identify your signals once you hear them is useful too. And uh, some of the latest SDR radios like the IC7300 and the 9700 uh, have an audio scope display that is excellent at showing display waveforms. This is the audio scope on the, on the 9700 and this is the one on 7300. You can see that they're identical. If you don't have one of those rigs yet, another way to see the audio is to hook a scope up to your headphone output. You can buy simple audio scopes for nothing, nearly nothing these days. And all you have to do is make a cable up and plug it into the headphone jack. Don't blow the thing up by turning the radio up too much. This little tiny oscilloscope right here was about $50. And you can see there's that telltale AC problem that was going on. And there it is right there. And this was plugged into the, uh, um, into the little SDR, uh, that little SDR radio, the Malahead. And uh, this is one that cost me 130 or $116, I guess it was. And uh, this is portable, completely portable uh, with its own battery and you can recharge it in the whole shebang. And, um, and I bought it about six months ago. However, I noticed today that they're selling for about $400 on Amazon now. So that I must, I must have got a really good deal. I know I got a good deal because the thing just works beautifully. So step one, start at home. This is when you're, find, you're trying to find sources of RFI. Put your receiver on DC battery power and connect it to your antenna. Turn off all the breakers and then the main power in your house and take a reading and take a picture of any noise you see with a smartphone. Turn on each breaker individually while listening on your radio. If noise returns, take your portable radio around to the things plugged in and find the offending one. That's the best possible way of finding RFI if you think that it may be in your house. 
regardless as to whether it's in your house or it's not, do this from time to time to get rid of any of those wall warts that are making noise and whatever, and replace them with more, it was something that wasn't necessarily made in China. When you finished all the power should be on in your house. By the way, just because your house is serviced by underground wiring, and I hear this all the time, it doesn't stop the noise. The noise could be coming from the distribution system and being transmitted by your house and house wiring, which is above ground. Or at least I would expect so, unless you live in a box or down under the ground. If you have not identified any noise sources, go to step two. Step two. Connect your receiver to a rotatable loop or antenna. See if you can get a null on your S meter showing the direction of the noise. Now, remember when you're getting this null, you're gonna get two nulls. You're gonna get one in one direction and one 180 degrees uh, from that. So you're gonna to have to search it out a little bit and see if you can find out where this noise is coming from by using an AM radio or something like that. Go past your neighbor's houses and listen for obvious noise coming from them. Check for vehicles plugged in and see if the power conditioners are singing. And I say that um, for, for one reason, it's because mine did. And I replaced the uh, power conditioner that I had on the battery and the noise went away. When you've identified a problem, document it and either approach the homeowner or send an email to the IC inspector to report a violation or send a note to the electrical utility to report the problem. Make sure you have all your duckies in a row before approaching them too. They will have to verify it. So the more information you can give them, the better. Date, time, location, frequency, pictures are all helpful. They hear complaints all the time from people saying, I don't know where it comes from. So, and, and if you haven't taken any time to try to find it, then don't expect them to be cooperative because they're not necessarily going to be, or you're gonna to go to the bottom of the pile. Don't waste their time under any circumstances. So if in doubt, call someone. If you've got a problem that you need to discuss, don't hesitate to give me a phone call and I'll try to help you through it if I can. I'm not saying that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I have had a significant amount of experience at finding these noise sources. And, uh, and it's been a lot of fun and a lot of people have gotten back on the air because of it. Well, I think we're done. You can contact me at v6arg at shaw.ca, or you can write down my phone number here if you like, and you can text me or you can give me a phone call whenever you want. And uh, I'm friendly. I haven't bitten anybody head off, anybody's head off for a long time. And, uh, um, and, and if you do have any, any problems with me, that's fine. Just do what you do with your radio when you don't like what you're hearing. Turn me off. I'll hand it back to you. Any questions? Warren, do you want to manage the discussion? Oh, uh, yeah. I just uh, leave it at the, the questions, the general questions here, and uh, open it up. Open it up for anyone. Uh, like to make a question? I can go. The uh, so, so Tom, the uh, have you used the diversity reception stuff to um, cancel out noise, or just as a, as trying to actually um, use the diversity antennas to to pull in the best signal? Yeah, just using the diversity antenna just to pull in the best signal. That's really what I what I was trying to do. I haven't done a whole lot of it. But the part that I like about it, I, as you know, I, I own a 7610, which has diversity reception as well. However, their diversity reception, I find a little peculiar because they leave it up to your brain to figure it out. Mm. What they do is they feed the two signals, the separate signals from each receiver in the 7610 through headphones so that you've got one on one side and one on the other. And your diversity reception is what happens between your, between your brain. Now, nobody bothers to mention anything about the fact that what happens if you're deaf in one ear, you know, basically you're only going to hear one side. So it really makes me kind of wonder. However, um, I've been building a receiver uh, using the, the SDR Duo. Uh, and it's a little, just a little thing with, a, with its own, um, uh, what's the word I'm 
looking for. It's it's got its own touch screen, it's got its own display, um, and it's all self-contained. And it's got protection in the front end for both of the receivers, and uh, uh, so that if anything transmits close to it, it will uh, it cuts the antennas right off. And uh, so it, it it's uh, it's kind of a neat thing that I've just been playing with over the last month or so. Um, but I tried the diversity reception on the Duo, and it is absolutely splendid. It works perfectly. It does exactly what it used to do back in 1965 when I used to use them, you know, in the Navy. So, and uh, we had to use diversity reception for, for copying cryptographic uh, stuff because we had machines that would decode it. It all had to be timed. We, and, uh, and it was kind of interesting stuff, but uh, that's how our teleprinters were, were operated and uh, all the broadcast and all the, uh, the heavy duty messages would have to be sent that way. So, it, but we use diversity receivers for doing that, a couple of rack all RA-17s. So it was pretty interesting stuff. Does that answer your question, Dan? It does, I was just, just curious your experience. So there was um, a fellow out of Calgary, John Fallows, that's done yeah. a couple of interviews where, where he's been using diversity antennas for the purpose of canceling noise out. Um, yeah. Right. So, so um, well, using an antenna that receives a noise source um, better, more strongly than the desired signal, and you can flip it 180 degrees and, and cancel it out in the radios. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. But, you know, it's essentially what happens with the 10 um, or with this diversity receiver that they have in the in the SDR duo, because uh, it, it all, not only matches the amplitude of the antenna. Uh, you know, the actual signal strength, but it also matches the phase. And so what it does is it is it you can actually see it on a display on the uh, SDR Runo um, where you'll see the phase will move around as it's uh, uh, as it's being detected. And uh, as the phase changes, because on HF, the phase changes all the time. Um, you're, it's quite surprising to see how well it works. Pretty cool stuff. The other thing is, is that, uh, you know, as far as noise reduction is concerned, um, the uh, the MFJ 1086, or not, is it? No, it's the 1026, I beg your pardon. Uh, the 1026 does much the same thing. It receives on a sense antenna, and it, uh, which it, where it receives mostly noise, and then it has a main antenna, which then connects to your rig. And, uh, and what it does is it, uh, it changes the phase so that the noise, which always seems to be at a different phase angle than the actual signal itself, is reduced. And uh, so it nulls it out. Pretty neat way of doing things. Of course, it requires that you keep tuning the thing until you get it right. But, but uh, And a lot of people find it pretty frustrating to run it that way. But, uh, uh, but it does work, you know, and it works very effectively as far as I'm concerned. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. And uh, what is the recourse uh, that you have if you do locate the source of the, the interference? It's in a residential house. And uh, how do you handle the politics of that? Do you approach the, the, the owner? owner of the house or do you get a hold of the inspector and, and, and the inspector goes and, and uh, confirms that that's the location of the house but the homeowner refuses to do anything about it. Is it what, is, what do you do then? <laughs> yeah, well, it gets, it, once it gets out of your hands where there isn't anything you can do, if you kindly go over and say, well, you know, I, I'm a ham radio operator and, I'd, and I'd, uh, I've noticed that there's uh, some sort of problem around this area. And I wonder if you would be, if you could help me with this. And then you identify it and offer to help him fix it. And, uh, and if he becomes reluctant to do that, then that's the time when you have to step in and, and you know, have the RI step in and take care of the problem from that point on. But you've got to do your due diligence first and make sure that you're not going to annoy that person. Uh, because if you do, you'll just get into a, you know, what match, and that's no fun. So, 
uh, but, but be kind with these people because they really don't have any technical knowledge in most cases and uh, help them out and show them what the problem is and tell them what it is that you're experiencing and, and where you think it's coming from. Um, there are a lot of people who run into problems with people with bad power supplies in their computers and stuff like this. And those things are just horrendous to fix uh, as far as, well, they're horrendous to get people to fix unless you actually buy them a power supply and replace it for them. And uh, sometimes you just have to do that. So, but it's all diplomacy. And I'm about as diplomatic as a hydrogen bomb going off in your backyard. So it's very difficult for me because I'm a typical alpha male. Would you uh, use some of your equipment that you use to, to track it down to show them and demonstrate what was going on? And if you can convince them to turn off their equipment and see what the difference is on the testing um, screens? Well, the only time that I've ever had that experience is uh, with a next door neighbor who had some problems with some lighting. And he needed some help with that lighting because uh, what was happening was his garage door uh, kept opening and closing for some reason or another. And it was because of the, the LED lighting of all things, there was a harmonic coming off it that uh, when it was on, it wouldn't work when he was at the end of his driveway. But uh, the, then uh, as soon as he got closer to the driveway and he tried to use it, he'd push it and it would open up and then it would go down again. And it would go up and then down and up and down. And he wanted me to help him try and find the solution to that. I don't know that I was really successful at it, but I sure gave him an awful lot of, uh, of ferrite beads to stick on things to see if he could get rid of that problem. But uh, that's the only time I've ever had a real interaction with anybody. And uh, um, that, so I, I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that was great. Uh, thanks, Tom. Does anyone else have any other further questions? Uh, for Tom, we'll just uh, leave the floor open here for a minute. Tom, the protection that you're using for the front end of the SDR duo, any specifics? Something commercial, something you built? Something I built. Yeah, I'm too cheap to buy commercial stuff. You know, when you go out and buy a 7610, you become really cheap, really fast after that. So, um, no, what all I do is, uh, is I make sure that there is a pair of, uh, of uh, one end, um, uh, one zero zero seven no across the input, um, you know, back to back. And I have, uh, uh, and I also um, put a, uh, a small, um, you know, like a little flea light bulb in there, uh, you know, a grain of wheat light bulb, and, uh, and then an RF choke that goes to ground. And uh, so that protects the front end uh, of the radio pretty much. Nothing can go over 0.7 of a volt. And, uh, and, and that works really well. But I've also added one other thing in there, and I put a relay in there so that it disconnects the antenna completely and uh, from the input to the to the SDR or to the uh, um, to the uh, SDR play, and I think that that is just it may be overkill, but I'm doing it regardless. I just uh, I just don't want to blow the front ends of those. I'll tell you where this I'm comes from. I blew one up. There. That's what happened. So, hey, sorry, I missed the number on the diode you're using. Oh, one in four zero zero sevens. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, uh, just some noise. No, uh, I'll have to tinker with that. What are you using for a PC to run the Duo? Is it something Android or Raspberry oh, Pi? Or? No, the Duo is run uh, with a PC, an actual PC, but it's uh, it's called a little B-Link, it's called. And uh, you can buy them for about 150 bucks. And it's uh, a little tiny thing. Actually, I'll, I'll go and get it and then you can have a look at it. I don't know whether you'll be able to see this thing or not, but whoops, let me just get it in front. Oh, I know what's happening. Hold on for a second. There it is. Whoops. Why does it keep going away? Oh, there we go. 
So that's what the thing looks like. I'll turn around the front. Might be easier for you to see it. So there it is. That's what it looks like. It's just a little receiver that I built and I made the plastic uh, front uh, by uh, carving it out and putting a, uh, um, and making a rubber mold and then poured the mold with, uh, with plastic and, and then sanded it all down, got it all cleaned up and put it on the front. So let me get rid of my background here and that will show up a little better and then we won't uh, have that problem anymore. Hold on for one second. Okay, that should, now you can see the mess in my office. So this is what it looks like. So that's the front of the radio. Here's the inside. You can see that the SDR Duo is, is on this, uh, on the other side. It's against the wall and the actual computer is on the other wall on the other side. And inside everything is connected using a, uh, uh, using a USB hub. On the back wall, that's where the two relays and the one relay for the audio amplifier that cuts off the audio amplifier when, uh, when anybody's transmitting close. It's got a push to talk switch on there and, uh, and, it, and I can turn it all off by doing it that way. So all you have on the front, couple of speakers, the tuning knob, the on off switch and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the phone, the, you know, the, uh, the headphone jack and of course the audio for turning the audio up and up and down. And there is an amplifier inside way down in that corner, you know, in the bottom corner on where I am on the side there. And uh, I used a piece of uh, a plexiglass here for the for the knob or for this for turning it on and off and this piece of plexiglass is connected to a, um, a just it's just going through a little bracket that I've got so I can push the thing and it will turn the the computer on and off the computer measures four inches by four inches by uh, by three quarters of an inch so it's a very small PC it's very powerful, actually. It's only got four gig of memory, but and it's got sixty-four uh, gig of uh, of uh, uh, drive in it as well. But it handles everything perfectly. And uh, there's two speakers in there and two two watt amplifiers, uh, stereo amplifiers that I can use. The part that's neat is that I can pull the input to the stereo amplifiers out and use it as a bench amplifier as well, and it works very well. So it's just a toy that I've been playing with just for the fun of it. And I've been writing some articles on it as well. So any other questions? Sorry, long-winded. Will your speaks. slides be available uh, on the CARA website to have a, a look uh, at afterwards if I want to refresh my memory? That was a great package. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. So. Sure, if Tom's willing to supply them, we can uh, post them on the uh, CARA website and our plan is also to post the link for the video so you can listen to it again and get another refresh. That'd it, be great. I, I need didn't take notes twice. on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're more than welcome, Ken. Happy to help. <laughs> Tom, I, I wanted to thank oh, you for um, the great presentation. Oh, I, uh, I do have a question for you, though. Sure. Um, I participated or I'm just learning a little bit about fox hunting and I struggled a bit with the um, directional um, signal detection especially when I got stronger like to build the circuit that would allow me to find the fox by using um, uh, amp, um, attenuate the signal strength so I'm wondering if you have to do that with the noise when you're looking for it or is it more obvious and you don't have to quite do the fox hunting technique? absolutely absolutely you must do it Yes, it's uh, you, you've got to have a way of attenuating your signal some way or another, you know, RF gain or whatever it is that you're using. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can build a, uh, a device just out of uh, just out of resistors that will give you um, a certain amount of attenuation. And it works very well. Just build an attenuator, make it a step attenuator just with some switches. 
so and do some it. Some of us that. know about that, hey, Wilson. <laughs> yeah, I I worked on one of those. <clears throat> yeah, who who worked on one of those? Wilson. Nope. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, worked on a step attenuator. Yeah, yeah. Well, they work very well if you if you do it right. You know, no, maybe I things, didn't do it right. I, you need to isolate the isolate the resistors between the different sections because you uh, when you don't when you don't do that you will end up with crossover and you don't want that so you have to isolate the resistors so you build it out of you build your attenuator out of pc board material and do it that way and just feed it through feed the resistor right through the uh, a hole in the pc board okay i i used um copper sheet um yeah uh and put a copper between each of the resistor yeah uh boxes but maybe uh, they're not it's not closing it up to the top that goes on kind of thing so yeah yeah you've got to make sure it's 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 rf tight yeah you need to make more boxes and then tie the boxes together so Just it doesn't go have on, any chance. Go on Amazon and buy a whole bunch of PC board material. Don't go and buy it downtown at B&E because it'll cost you $1,000 for what it is that you want to do. And uh, But you can buy PC board material on Amazon for about $10 for about 20 pieces. So it's pretty inexpensive. And get the thin stuff because it works really well. And now you've got double shielding So because it's double-sided board. <clears throat> I had great success building a little scissors. TDOA. Um, attenuator or a uh, uh, box and i think it was cheaper than a bunch of resistors and, and less less effort oh, yeah. it didn't take me much to build yeah. it at all oh that's good yeah 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 well i've i don't know i've got fifty thousand resistors sitting in this place so i don't have any problem finding what i what it is i need so yeah i just collect parts my wife my wife thinks i'm absolutely nuts but you know something She's not far wrong, and uh, <laughs> it's okay. She's a collector too. So, uh, Tom, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Um, the diversity reception. That's uh, I'm a new ham. Mm -hmm. uh, I was licensed in March. Uh, diversity receptions. First time I've heard that term, and uh, in my mind. Uh, the thing that comes to me is Doppler shift. Am I correct in assuming that, or uh, I, I'm wondering if, if if you can explain that a bit a bit better for me, please? No, it's not Doppler shift. It's actually shift of the of the uh, because Doppler shift is is dealing with speed primarily, but uh, uh, diversity reception is where you have two separate antennas that are receiving the same signal. And they will be out of phase with each other. And that's typically what happens. So you try to keep your antennas uh, anywhere from 25 or 50 feet apart. And uh, when you do that, you'll end up with two separate signals and you bring them together and the software will combine them into one audio signal. But they will also, but they will look at uh, on one of the signals, they will look at the uh, at the phase that it's coming in at, and then it will be compared with the other one, and then they will combine the phases. And that's, uh, and that's how you end up with diversity reception. Diversity in this particular case means that you're listening with two antennas and coming out with one single signal, which will, uh, which if one is, uh, has some uh, uh, QSB on it or whatever, the other one will pick it up. So you don't end up losing the signal. Okay, thank, thank you very much. That clears it up real good. Thanks. I hope that helps. Tom, that uh, using the phase uh, was the uh, concept that I was trying with another fox on antenna uh, by separating the antennas by I think it was a, a half a phase length and using different lengths of feed lines to get together yep. with the idea that the one phase would offset the other phase and would end up with a null when uh, they were lined up. And sometimes that happens, that's right. And, uh, and that's, that's a great way of doing things. If you get into VHF, UHF, which I know you guys are involved with, 
Um, uh, read that up in read about it in in the AWRL handbook and the VHF handbook and stuff like that. And they, they've got some really great ideas as to how it works and how to make it happen. When you get up into microwaves, now it becomes really important. And uh, when you talk about nulling things out, wow, <laughs> pretty easy to do when you're up in microwaves because you're dealing with smaller parts and pieces, thank goodness. I have not done a lot of work with microwave over the years. Uh, that's the one thing that I've not really delved into. Um, I just want to say thank you very much. It was just an excellent presentation. It was really well laid out, and it was very interesting as well, informative. Um, a couple of things. This is a different topic, I guess, but I've got a vehicle that's giving me all kinds of interference problem. It's just started about a month ago, and I've done everything. I've cleaned all the grounds in it. I've checked the coil. The noise is not RPM dependent. It's just background noise. And I just can't find it. So short of buying a new truck, what do you reckon? <laughs> Have you had any experience with that? Actually, I haven't. I, uh, uh, but as far as noise is concerned, yeah, get, get a receiver out there and find out where it's coming from. Actually get a portable receiver out there and discover where it's coming from and just move around the vehicle until you find out where it's emanating from and go from there. You may have there may be a computer that's giving up the ghost on those things. And you know what, you know what trucks are like today. The average vehicle has anywhere from 100 to 150 computers in it. And uh, that's why they're having such a terrible time these days with trying to get all of these parts and pieces, other than the fact that all of the ones that they're using are all 15 year old technology. So and it, with the exception of uh, some of the more modern uh, automobile companies that build their own, and you know of whom I'm speaking. The, uh, uh, but all of the older vehicles are having problems with computers these days because they just can't get them. And uh, when I'm talking about older vehicles, I'm talking about the new ones that use the old technology. So, but yeah, that's what I would do. I'd take a portable receiver and go out and see if you can find it, Richard. I've already done that. I have an AM radio, an old portable one, you know, from the 60s, and I've been digging around, but I bet you it is the computer. That's a brilliant suggestion. I appreciate it. One more point, too. The TELUS boxes for cable, the newest, latest, and greatest, are using the 20-meter ham band, <laughs> and uh, uh, they know all about it, and they will come out to your house and fix it free of charge and apologize profusely but they're not going to change it. Um, I've got Industry Canada after them already, and there's a, there's a bit of a fight going on, but they're not going to do anything. So just to let you know about that, um, oh, well, they know all about it. And they'll... Yeah. Pardon me? I hadn't heard that. I'm going to talk to my friend down here who works for TELUS and is a ham. That's V6BBE. And uh, I'm going to talk wow. to him and find out what he knows about it, because that's interesting. So, yeah, yeah. I hadn't heard that. Is, is that Plus the hearts, right? Whatever happened to AGT, anyway. <laughs> is that legal for yeah. them to uh, use uh, the uh, ham band? Are we in a, in a joint use in the band or? No, no, but, but they are, uh, but what they're doing is they're using, uh, it's just like we used to use television frequencies for our color burst on the televisions. The color burst was 3.5 megahertz. And, uh, and that's right in the middle of the amateur band. And um, it's the same thing. It's, uh, it's use that they can do as long as it doesn't emanate a signal too far. The problem with us is that we have communications receivers that are so sensitive that we can, you know, we can listen to a gnat's nuts at 30 miles without any trouble at all. And that's what the issue is. The fact that our, uh, and I know Industry Canada came to me, uh, they were down here a little while ago, and they said, you know, Tom, your equipment is so sensitive that we can't hear what you're hearing. And I said, yeah, I know. But that's the problem with all of this newer stuff that's out there is the fact that it is so sensitive and so beautifully put together. So especially when you look at SDR play receivers, they're phenomenal how well those things work so because you, you're trying to and capable of picking up signals of uh low wattage from 
the other side of the world. Exactly. Which doesn't have very much uh, energy in it by the time it gets to you. Precisely. Yeah. And that is the issue. And, you know, and when you look at guys like, for instance, you know, the radio inspector that comes down here, and I'm not knocking the guy, he's a nice guy, but he really doesn't have a lot of knowledge when it comes to amateur radio. Because he's, you know, I mean, he had no clue as to what I was doing. They were down here visiting in the shack with me. And he had a, a new employee that was working with him. And, uh, and they had never seen what it is that I have here. And they were just astounded by the sensitivities and what it is that I could see and hear in this, in this shack. And I have nothing special. It's just normal radio stuff, you know? Hmm. Oh, well. But that's one of the, that's really something to keep in mind as you talk to them yeah. about uh, where they are and you know. oh absolutely yeah it's not like it's not like the old guys who who knew it all because they were us so today <laughs> these people are interested in finding interference noise and they're looking for uh, that interference noise that they're looking for. They don't have equipment that's sensed enough to, to even hear it. And that's the problem. But you and I would when be bothered I got, by, got you, the, know, you know, we're, we're bothered by a signal that's neg 100. They're bothered by a signal that's neg 25. You know, we'll put it that way. So, so that's where the issue When I got. Sorry, Richard. Uh, Richard. No, that's okay. When I got TELUS involved, I had to trace the whole circuit myself first. Yeah. And I had to find out exactly which wire was acting like an antenna and all this stuff. And then when the guys came in and said, this is the problem, this is what's going on, shorten this wire, you know, and lengthen this wire and change this over here. And then they knew what to do. But other than that, they didn't know how to fix it either. But they were aware of the problem. So exactly. You're yeah. right. 